that I'm singing up stage. First of all, I would like to thank the International Foundation, especially Baltasar Garzón and his team. There is quite a number of people here running up and down, helping us all out with microphones, cameras, Twitter, Facebook, and everything. They want to make it happen everywhere. And I'm happy and honored to be part of this. Thank you for the chairperson. Uh, thank you, chairperson. Thank you, colleagues here sitting next to me, because you make it for me to be an honor to be here. Now, uh, here today, to compliment what you're going to, to say and what's been said ever since yesterday and, and, well, today and tomorrow, and I hope there's room for this. Something which is obvious and it's uh, part of all the, the things that we'll be discussing over these four days, but sometimes it's so very obvious that we do not use the time to look into specific elements of what this given to the transition in different countries, uh, whether it is Spain, Europe, and how they've all contributed. So, given an example, uh, recent example, which I know firsthand because I'm working with Oye and other colleagues, we've all contributed because this is a large scale, but somehow we've pushed it forward in Guatemala. And well, this is an example that I would like to share and give you some of the examples that I fortunately, lastly, know firsthand. This is post Pinochet's era, but we haven't talked about those tangible, specific contributions of universal justice. Generally speaking, uh, beyond complementarity, which uh, is introduced by the Rome Institute and which further develops what we've done, and I think that it's forward looking for human rights and national and third country courts. Beyond all that, there's something else that I would like to say, and it's not emphasized enough. Whenever you think of investigating or prosecuting these kind of violations of human rights and international crimes, the best form, the best form, the one that we would all pick, the one that we would all like to have, do not be mistaken, is actually jurisdiction of judges wherever crimes were committed. That's our calling, that's what we want. But because of very different reasons, this has not been possible, which means, uh, well, not that judges are not competent, but because of political questions, legal circumstances, this has not been possible. So, I'll discuss a couple of things. Investigation and prosecution, these are two different things. Investigation against what's usually uh, considered, because sometimes it seems that these are, are fungi growing up, the, uh, up the, the, the grass. Well, actually, they are isolated. This is a result of very complicated process and proceedings. So you have witnesses, evidence, documents, uh, sometimes highly costly for those that provide you with them and that I had compiled them over time. This happens during repression times, during conflict times. That's when victims are brave enough with Horacio or Ernesto Sabato, the are those stakeholders who start compiling all the statements of all the witnesses, claiming tortures, disappearance, experiences, and they risk their lives during those convulsive times. But that large amount of information, in my opinion, was not always gathered thinking that there would be a prosecution one day. I, I guess that this is not the case. They knew that that information had to be gathered, had to be recorded, had to be preserved. So one day there would be a process out there, there would be a proceeding. It is evidence-based? Well, no, but in the end it ends up being. It was not designed as evidence-based, but it ended up being so. And in my opinion, you could have a nice investigation, which of course starts in those places where crimes were committed, and without it, uh, without that contribution, it wouldn't be possible. Don't be mistaken. Uh, this is different from a good legal strategy or an evidentiary process, and also to achieve justice 
in in this formal process with with the prosecutor and and a defending lawyer and i think that's what's contributed and that's what we found in watermelon example that i'll try to break down to you that's universal justice in spain in spain we all have our priorities we have different ideas we have the concept of feasibility because this was international criminal law that was being developed at the same time as a proceeding against the military group in um, of pinochet and so i think we see how there is an international vulnerability of a former head of the state who was still holding a public office because he was a senator. It was the first time in history that a public official was uh, sitting in the bench in, in a trial with all the upset and uprest because the Roman statutes were being adopted. It was also true that in process, as Joan mentioned, Joan Gosses, I mean, you see that those processes that were seen as a framework at a national context with uh, national lawyers, prosecutors, judges, um, due diligence, habits, uh, good and bad habits, defects, virtues that had developed at a national level, they would be made available for crimes of, a nat of an international nature. And of course, that entails a series of difficulties. Then, after 15, 17 years, uh, Guatemala, it started back in 1999. It is the third claim, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, that it's lodged before the criminal court. The same has happened with other claims that were mentioned yesterday. In, initially, there was negative acceptance some duty back, uh, somebody today said about this idea of a boat that we were missing. Somehow Argentina was risking that fight, and so they were fearful. And against all the odds, it ended up before the Constitutional Tribune Court in 2005. And I think this is the first and only sentence confirming that jurisdiction in our system, referring to universal jurisdiction per se, with full extension and not limited to the nationality of victims. That's when, 2006, and it's been, uh, guinea pig might not be the term, but it was a case where there are some specificities which, since I was not an active part, because I was just having a seek or having a drink at, at, at the court with other people, so I was not an active part, and I was not familiar with this. But then in 2006, when I was already active, I think it, it is clear this large amount of investigative work for the systematization of the information on in information abuse, on other kinds of legal abuses, slaughters, and um, torture, things that were happening and that were being recorded in a bit more formal or at least sophisticated way. There was not room for high sophistication because back then there was no computer, just a few of them. But still, we had lots of important information about all those legal abuses. Then there was an option to have a truth commission, which still in contributes to what had been done. And I, I guess this is worth reiterating, always working hand in hand with the victims, with their braveness, with their efforts, their endurance, who had risked their own lives. The thing in Guatemala, there was an open mindset after this uh, sentence by the Constitutional Court that I mentioned. And in Guatemala, well, we had lots of documents, but they were not considered evidence. Uh, they had been sent to the criminal court and I don't think it would be fair to any judge to say that, OK, you've got lawyers, and we all have our own role, and we all contribute. And I think whether we were wrong or right, I don't know, but 
there was a legal strategy deli uh, approved to have the genocide acknowledged as a crime. So that's why the positions are so important. And there was a strategy designed according to which the, 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 the position of victims, testimonials of victims, which is this idea of an expert pundit, legal pundit, when, by those times where you need to prove things that you cannot prove by regular evidence, it was difficult. It was difficult for them to, because there was no option to prosecute them in Guatemala, but luckily, uh, try court number one, number one here in Spain, because it was back then in 2006 when they were starting and they lead an effort where we see there is room, there is an opportunity to have over 40 testimonials from victims uh, and they were given their statement. They all came to Spain and so we had those pundits, those experts, expert witnesses. And uh, maybe you do not follow, but that's the way we used to work by defining what a genocide is, because it's a complicated and complex crime. There, there is, this is US-like, US and there was kind of an open platform. Uh, I don't know what the expression would be, but it would be a valid scenario. So whenever we would find concealed documents, con uh, documents that had been hidden for safety and security reasons, and that had been filtered out or revealed by military people after war, and they had been kept awaiting for a place to lodge them. And that was here at the National Criminal Court with Justice Pedraz, because they were uh, he was the recipient of those documents, uh, documents that had been considered relevant for the trial that I'm about to mention now. And I know it might seem the time just show enough, but Manuel and myself, we always thought that maybe these will go back to Guatemala, that it would be a trial in Guatemala and everything would be sent over there. So we, we were working with people from Guatemala, lawyers and judges from Guatemala. For example, Claudia Pacipaz, a wonderful woman who is now a general attorney. and. They were helping us out to see what could work in Guatemala until 2012. We got a shock. We had an investigation or prosecuting judge who shocked us and decided to follow this in Guatemala. He used an exceptional circumstance, political circumstance, and that was international upheaval against General Latone that had been chosen but was related to drug dealing and other problems in Guatemala. And when he left, Claudia Pathy Path, who used to be a professor, having a PhD by the University of Salamanca, working in human rights, a fair person, and she became general prosecutor. What about Guatemala? Well, these kind of things made it possible to prosecute in a promptly way. It, maybe too much, because they had not completed the transition process, as Joan said. I really like what you said. I'm not just uh, um, complimenting you, but they still have a lacking rule of law, and it's difficult to have effective transition. And, and that's where Guatemala finds itself right now. We are witnessing that. We started prosecution. There were threats. Back then, it could not be said, but now I can say the, the judges were threatened with ju Justice Barbers. Uh, that was 20. So it, that was January 2012 when there were those threats. Sorry again. December 2012, January 2013, there are threats, clear threats, which meant that these proceedings that were supposed to have the hearings in August, September 2013, well, it had to be done uh, fast track, and it was uh, March last year then. Although it had been considered, and we've already discussed, that uh, taking into account the event evidentiary processes, uh, I don't want to bore you then, but 
you need to face this when, when you think these are subtle cases so that they are negligible, but actually are well thought, are funded, are thorough. And so we try and picture the impacts of a future potential prosecution in Guatemala, but what never came to mind, what we never thought was to have a whole evidentiary structure so that the prosecutor's office could have it in place in less than a month's time and that they would have to take upon themselves a work that uh, they uh, they've already find because they have a procedural system that it is still a trial and error it is uh, difficult to define two minutes two minutes and a half okay here in Spain, and that's what I wanted to say, everything we did. And when I say Spain, is just because it was initiated in Spain is not because of uh, being whole, uh, considered the other. What's, what was done here in Spain, and with the input of people from Guatemala, expert from Guatemala, everything was sent back to Guatemala. And so they had national prosecution on the counts of genocide with over 102 victims, direct victims from different ethnic groups and who could give their statement, women talking about gender-based violence, something unheard of in this kind of, of, of proceedings, but that is now included into this kind of proceedings for human rights violations. We see the same expert witnesses, the declaration, uh, depositions, some of them were enlarged, but again, using the work of pundits. And uh, this is an example of how tangible it is, how immediate it is uh, to consider those proceedings of prosecutions, because people think it, they are pointless, and maybe there is no evidence in Spain because uh, there is no in absentia a tra a trial or, or pros prosecution, but I think we need to fight for complementarity, we need to work together, we need to cooperate. So I would like them to be many more. I would like them to become the pattern, to become the model for us. There will be new amendments, there will be new claims, we will learn from previous lessons. and. There is this colleague on the audience for sustainability. I think this needs to be the standard. This needs to be just the initial effort, because in the end, this will help and transform transitional processes in other countries in a positive way. Thank you very much. Well, we have a question for Almudena now. So in view that the proof or the evidence in case of breach of violation of human breach or violation of human rights is obtained in a highly critical situation. Is there any lawfulness, perhaps for this type of situation where the standards are um, softened or not, or not, and the due process continues to be ensured? It is an interesting question that we often ask ourselves. My personal opinion from my experience is the following. There are two levels, standards of evidence. I'm working in two jurisdictions, Spanish one, and then the US one. Well, I don't have so many colleagues there, uh, and I had to study more. So the evidentiary standards are the same. So here we have the ones that have been stated in our civil or penal code. So having said that, difficulties do not soften the evidentiary criterion and do not allow you to play around with the proceedings. So, but having said that, 
the courses that I've been working on or that I have heard of, there is a room, there is room and a space for innovation and creativity, careful with these terms that I'm using, to make valid, effective means or evidences that perhaps in more traditional cases were not accepted as evidence. Well, this is the case because, well, sometimes we are talking about investigating cases that took place 30 years ago, direct witnesses or uh, people or direct victims are not alive anymore. They have just left a number of writings behind them. So that linked to the passing of time and sometimes the violence committed by the states or state agents. They do not have the competence or the capacity to commit the crime, but also to hide it, etc. So I think there has been like a evolution of that evidentiary uh, means. Well, I'm sure that you heard the case in the US of unclassified documents where Clinton president com had a commitment that started off with Latin America that were key for the Pinochet case. They decided to unclassify collection of documents from several agencies. Well, well, these were documents from boring uh, companies or agencies, but these documents contributed a lot. Then the U.S. started to register these cases or to hire people to analyze those documents. I don't know whether you've seen these documents, but they show up, you know, with many paragraphs that have been annulled or that have been made ineffective. So I very much appreciate the activity of what these people do because they know how to read those documents. Well, in the past, these documents were not accepted in the litigation against human rights violation. So what I mean is that, that the work that so now those standards have more flexible. They have made more flexible. And now they have a, a, they are evidentiary. They are, a, a, they are of an evidentiary. Entonces Almudena quiere agregar algo sobre este tema y después vamos al último tema que nos queda. Yo solo quería decir, uy, qué mal. Yo quería decir una cosa respecto a la primera pregunta. No, I would like to say something about the first question. Perhaps I am misinterpreted it. So when they want to disaccredit us or somehow criticize, which is good, you know, because it's part of our profession, well, we always move into that duality. So the U.S. think. Uh, understand my case. You know, I work in Latin America, I live in the US, and I come from Spain. So they question me like 27 times. You know, I live in a country that does not close the Guantanamo uh, prison. Well, it is a country that do not, does not answer to the letters of requests. And I'm also Spanish national, so which is, but. What I want to say is that this is a fake. So if we think that, well, if cases, uh, some cases are brought forward, or for instance, uh, against Donald Rumsfeld, so this is a dangerous discourse. Well, the reason for not doing the same thing in other places in the world is because it is not possible because of the legal system. So we have to operate in systems, in systems uh, with laws that we can really, well, we are allowed to to uh, to operate. So, and of course, for that to change, we need a change of mindset and to continue to develop the issue of universal jurisdiction further. So it is not a question that we are obsessed uh, about attacking the weakest countries, but it is just that those countries have come through a different processes, different justice processes. And because of the justice process that they have, well, they are open to this possibility. And then, well, the work has allowed us, uh, that we carried out, allowed us to do so. 
So the lack of justice in the uh, U.S. court or because of the Abu Ghraib uh, prison does not uh, take away.